Professor Paul Bingham, and this is Biochemistry One. Our topic uh, at the moment is oxidative phosphorylation. In some sense, this is the end of a long journey that we took all the way back beginning at glycolysis and through the citric acid cycle or the TCA cycle and through the electron transport system that generated the enormous proton gradient that then you go we're going to use today to make ATP. So where this phrase oxidative phosphorylation comes from is that it was recognized early on that food was oxidized, food molecules were oxidized, and ATP was the result. The mechanism was unclear, and so it was just called oxidative phosphorylation. That, f that catchphrase now in some sense refers collectively to the electron transport system, which we talked about last segment, and to the uh, system that we'll talk about today that translates the proton gradient into ATP. Collectively, those can be called oxidative phosphorylation. Okay, so um, let's, let's uh, zero in on our fundamental problem. We want to make ATP, and the uh, gamma, uh, very often the um, beta-gamma bond and hydride bond is hydrolyzed to release energy. In vivo, that free energy is, in fact, 40 to 50 kilojoules per mole. The, the standard free energy in vitro is 30.5, as you probably recall. But there's reason to believe that it's higher than that in vivo, 40 to 50 kilojoules per mole. And when we uh, burn that, as we do, for example, to drive the myosin motors and muscle contraction and many other ways that we've talked about, uh, phosphorylating intermediates and in, um, glucose, for example, and glycolysis, phosphorylating proteins, as we'll talk about later in regulatory uh, context and so on. All of these different m many, many, many tens of thousands of uses of ATP to sh uh, provide energy to drive otherwise endergonic processes. Um, the hydrolysis of ATP is, ex is exergonic to do that, but of course to, to synthesize ATP to run that process in reverse, we need that is endergonic and we need to couple it to another exergonic process to make ATP. So let's be very clear. So to make ATP is endergonic, therefore we need to couple it to a massively exergonic process. The proton gradient that we've spent the last segment generating uh, through the electron transport system is going to be the source of that energy. So we're going to allow the proton gradient to break down, electrons to flow back down their, the gradient, and that will be the exergonic process that's going to be used to drive ATP synthesis. That's, that is our goal today, to understand the molecular machine, the sophisticated one that does that. Uh, before we go forward, let me really emphasize something I said last uh, in the last segment, that um, the oxidative phosphorylation machinery, that is the electron transport machinery plus the ATP synthesis machinery we're going to talk about today, is the core of the generation of almost all energy, not quite all, but almost all of the energy that we use routinely. So when we go in and poison the process with something like cyanide, for example, we die almost instantly because this is the hub. This is the, the central marketplace in which food is turned into ATP. And that ATP then spreads out to drive almost all of biochemistry. All right. So these are the four pumps, uh, the three pumps, the four complexes in the electron transport system that we talked about earlier. And notice what they do. They're all pumping protons to the outside, that is from the matrix into the inner membrane space, the space between the inner and outer membranes. They're pumping them across the inner membrane. That's the what the electron transport system, that's its whole reason for being, as we talked about last segment. And that's, that uh, uh, happens in the mi uh, mitochondrion, so that matrix protons are pumped into the inner membrane space. The machine that we're going to talk about today is called the ATP synthase, and there are uh, diagrams, copies of it diagrammed here uh, in cartoon form. And that ATP synthes synthase is going to turn into the opposite. It's going to let that the protons in the inner membrane space flow back into the matrix, breaking down the, comp the uh, gradient. But in the process, they're going to couple that f downhill flow of protons to cranking a widget that's going to make ATP, literally a, an ATP factory. So let's actually use an analogy to make clear again, as we did in the electron transport case, that our macroscopic intuition about energy applies just as potently to the microscopic biochemical level as it must, because they're governed by the same laws of thermodynamics, including the second law. So this is a water wheel. So you'll notice that water comes out that's 
spout at the top of the wheel, runs down and catches on the, uh, the little buckets in the wheel, and the weight of the water drives the wheel around and around and around. And the central axis of the wheel is coupled to a drive shaft, which can be used to run all kinds of machinery. Uh, in, the, in, in colonial America, for example, it was used to, to rotate grindstone, uh, grinding stones that would turn uh, corn and wheat into flour, for example. So the ATP synthase, which is the machine that's going to do the, the ATP synthesis that we're concerned with today, is analogous to this water wheel. And in fact, the proton gradients running downhill from the inner membrane space back into the matrix, where they're at low concentrations, are analogous to this water running downhill. They're going to crank, literally crank, a, the ATP synthase machinery very analogously to how this water wheel works. And of course, to keep the 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 biochemical water wheel going, the electron transport system goes to the bottom, collects the water, puts it back up top so it can flow back down, flow back down into the uh, uh, through the wheel uh, again. All right. So it's a it's a, 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 a perpetual motion machine, but not really. Right. You're making ATP and you're burning, reduce. You're burning your food, reduce hydrocarbons in order to keep putting that water back at the top so it can keep going over and over the water wheel again, making ATP. So this is not just a sort of vague uh, teaching analogy. This is a literal macroscopic mechanical analogy that's thermodynamically quite, quite analogous to what the uh, ATP synthase machinery is going to do, as you'll see over the next few minutes. It's literally a machine. So earlier in the course, we talked about proteins making molecular machines. We saw one interesting machine in the, in the contractile apparatus and the muscles, the myosin uh, 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 head group that actively translocates itself with respect to the actin filaments to drive muscle contraction. The ATP synthesis is another one of these literal machines. It's a widget. It's a machine that we can understand with the intuition that we've generated with macroscopic objects, as I hope you'll be able to recognize over the next few minutes as we look at the, the design of this machine. But let's go through uh, then the pieces again to make absolutely clear. The four component, three of the four components in the electron transport system pump protons, complexes one, three, and four. They create the proton gradient. Here's ATP synthase at the right hand of the image that you see on the screen and it is going to turn around and allow that proton gradient to flow back downhill, allow proteins to flow from high concentration in the extra inner membrane space back to low concentration in the uh, uh, matrix and in the process turn a widget which is going to make ATP and our goal again is to look at how that widget works. So here is the basic thermodynamics of that you can calculate the Gibbs free energy using the, the gas constant and uh, standard temperature and a couple of other constants that you need to know in this context. Let's walk through those. So obviously you know what the gas constant and the temperature are. pH you know. So Z is in fact the uh, charge and number of ions. In this case it's plus one because we're talking about protons. Uh, F, uh, F stands for the Faraday constant. Its value is given here at the bottom. And delta psi is the membrane potential, which by convention is voltage and has a positive sign in this uh, particular context. So in general, for most courses, you won't need to actually memorize this expression, but you may be asked to use it to solve uh, some quantitative problems. Uh, and in fact, energy required to pump one mole of mitochondrial proteins is an, in an animal is about 22 kilojoules per mole. And uh, if you plug in their relevant values, ATP synthesis is expected to take about 40 to 50 kilojoules per mole in vivo, as we talked about. Again, remember the, the free energy of hydrolysis in vivo is a little higher than the standard free energy of, of hydrolysis of ATP in vitro that we've talked about earlier. In practice, you'll recall from the electron transport system that about 10 protons are pumped per electron pair. So that would lead you to think that you have 220 kilojoules of energy. You should be able to make about four, a little more than four ATPs. A as a practical matter, you make about 2.5 ATPs. And the uh, rest of the proton, the energy in the proton gradient is used for other purposes, including uh, pumping phosphate uh, into the mitochondria in order to make ATP, things of that nature. Okay. All right. Let's, th those are the, that's sort of the, the abstract energetics and the, thermodynamic principles. Let's now look at the hardware, the machinery, the widget, the ratchets that make this work. So this is the X-ray crystallographic structure of the ATP synthase. Uh, 
It, ha it has two components called F0 and F1, um, named for historical reasons during their purification. Very gentle urea treatment will associate F1 from F0. You can study their components separately. That turned out to be very useful in the early days figuring out uh, how they worked. And so, in fact...